All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to this will be our lecture four, is that correct, or lecture three? We may be off a number here. Um, for ESS 586, 581, which is the Colorado State number, but also the Yay lectures, and welcome in Michigan Tech's class. Um, with Sarah G, who did say she would be a little bit late today. So we're going to actually, you know, spend a good amount of time today talking a little bit more about process and how to get our teams, our sort of multi-institutional teams off the ground. So I'm going to actually turn over at some point um, to Sarah H, who will introduce you to um, this is the framework that we'll use for the teams to come together um, and that we'll be following that framework in how we put together our information. But to get there, we want to introduce you to why this framework. And both stars will get a bad case of the giggles because I still struggle on pronouncing it correctly. But Tala Olna <laughs> dialogue. Tala Noah. <laughs> Tala Tala Noah. Noah. <laughs> She's going to send that to me in text messages, you know, so the site might sleep until I get it right. <laughs> Dialogues and this, the, the sustainable development team, de sustainable development goals and our team development. So let's go on to the next slide. So as the new classes are joining in, I want to make sure that we start each class with some objectives so people can sort of see our progress as we move forward. And so for this lecture, one of our main objectives, um, so a heads up to the um, Yay Fellows, is we're going to actually start the process of building these multi-institutional teams. Um, and as the fellows know, they've all been assigned to teams. Um, we have some of the students now on the call who will actually get joined into teams. And then more students will come in in the next couple of weeks as the remaining universities come on board. So we'll introduce the dialogues, the framework, um, and we're going to connect the dialogue to the Paris Agreement. And so our goal for today is to see where these things sit, why we're using them, um, how they're used in the global community to also build projects and teams. So next slide. So before we get there, we've got to go through some little bit of logistics. Um, so everybody who's on the call today can actually see what team they've been assigned to and students by the end of the call today, you're actually going to need to choose a team to be assigned with two, if you've not already chosen so, so you do have some chance to shift around for the students, the, S the AFLs have been assigned. So a couple of things as you think about through the lecture today and, and before you choose at the end of the lecture today, that each of the teams has a couple of characteristics to pay attention to. One is it has a lead faculty institution, um, a faculty advisor, and an institution. Um, so those are one of the core institutions that are working with the YAY project. And I know not all the institutions are on the call today, but they still will be actively involved with the teams. In each team, you will have a YAY fellow that has been assigned to that team. Um, and they will act mainly as your facilitator among the students. And again, that reminder that new students will be joining the teams regularly. So having a sense of roles and purposes helps keep this team moving towards a goal um, as new people come and new members join in. So for the students on the call today to choose a team and for the students watching the video, you have to meet the following criteria. We need to get students on teams as quickly as we can. Number one, the faculty lead of the, on the team that you have chosen to join is not from your institution. And number two, the yay fellow on the team that you've chosen to join is not from your institution. And number three, and this will be for most institutions except for the University of Derby in the UK because their class is a little bit bigger, um, the majority of the team members should not be from your institution. So for the students on the call today, which should be mostly Colorado State and Michigan Tech, both of those classes are fairly small. So we would highlight that you need to be on a team that does not have anyone from your institution on that uh, team as well. Next slide. 
Okay, so here are the teams, a little drum roll. So based on the survey and the polls, um, we've come up with the teams, assigned a faculty lead and assigned a fellow. Um, and I can't see quite clearly from my screen how many of the fellows are on board, but we will just go through this really quickly. And at the end of the class today, we're actually going to break into our teams, do a mingle and meet. So everyone can sort of meet each other on the team, um, set some parameters. It may just be you and the fellow or the fellow and the faculty member who's on the call. Um, but again, that gives us a chance to get started. We have to start building the teams. So of the 17 SDGs, um, not all of them are chosen. And as things move along, we may see if there is the opportunity to add additional SDGs based on students' preferences and as the teams start to grow. So the first one is health and well-being. That will be the faculty lead on that is Diane Husek from Moravian and the fellow is Emily from Colorado College. So rather than read through all of these, I'm gonna make sure everybody has this slide, but I do believe most folks are on the call with a couple of exceptions. Um, so again, number four is Pam and Melissa. Number nine is Leah and Ali. Number 11 is Sarah H and Elsie. Number 12 is myself and Anma, Anama, sorry. Uh, number 13 is Sarah G and Macy, 14 and 15 currently are combined. And that's Andrew from the U Darby, Javier from La Molina in Peru. And that's Emma and Zach. And then 16 is Jesse and Kosmali. So this gives you an idea of the current breakdown and again for the students who are on the call we need to by the end of this class to be on one of these teams and then you get to meet uh, the members of your team who are on the call next slide okay so a couple of just notes and reminders and we'll remind this everybody of this as we move along is that with the new classes joining um, in the next couple of weeks it's important to welcome everybody to your team uh, make them feel part of the team. To make these teams work, it helps that everyone has a clear task and goals. So everybody needs to pull some weight. Um, when you work on virtual teams, that's a critical element that you may or may not have experienced in a team that actually has a chance to meet face to face. So it's really important that we set out roles for everyone on the team so the team can move forward and everybody has that sense of responsibility. And we'll keep discussing this as we build these virtual teams and bring in examples so everyone can have that experience. Next slide. Okay, so now as our turn, what we want to do is welcome you, and Bula means welcome in the Fijian language, to the Tayaloga dialogue. So we just have a fun video from Bonn, Germany to play, and Sarah will start the video. I hope the sound works. <laughs> video and if you get a chance to watch it um, with it when the internet is working a little bit better that was pausing is it's that reminder that the UN is a multicultural organization and as we work with our dialogues it's important that we bring that multicultural 
Islamism in. And for these teams, we have universities from all over the United States. Uh, we have students who are virtual, so they may be even more dispersed than their home institution. And we also have international institutions present. So this idea of multicultural space is probably one of the biggest things that I see um, that's different when you work in the UN space versus the you know, typical sort of US uh, centric academic setting. So for example, if you may have noticed in that video, um, that was actually presented by the country of Fiji, um, but it was a celebration of Polynesian culture. And oh gosh, here I go again. The Tayaloga dialogues is part of a Polynesian culture. And each time the UNFCCC changes its presidency and leadership, that country has the opportunity to bring in its own cultural context. And as you may have noticed, or you've noticed in some of the other pictures and videos from the Bonn conference, um, that most people uh, come in traditional dress um, and they represent that they speak in their traditional languages and they will also present traditional ceremonies within the context of the UN. And that's a fun part of being at the UN is to widen your own horizons as to their 200 plus countries in the world and I have no idea how many languages um, and to see some of those express. So that drum group was actually the group of Polynesian islands led by the Marshall Islands plus Fiji and a bunch of other different islands were all engaged in that presentation. So it's just a good way to start the conversation. So as we work on our teams, we're gonna follow this Polynesian um, setup that was brought to the COP at a very particular time. And again, when I use the term COP, that means the Conference of the Parties of for the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And this refers to Bonn, Germany, which is COP23 or the 23rd meeting of the COP. And why this was important is that the Paris Agreement set up a fundamental change in the way the nations look at responsibility. And because that dialogue became so important, we as the sort of the faculty felt it would be an important way for you as teams representing multicultural and multi-regional spaces to work through that process the same way the UN works through that process, which is the foundation behind the Paris Agreement. So Tayaloga means Tala, telling stories, and stories can be told from any perspective. And Sarah H. will get more into the details of this. But it's important that we realize that every story has its own seating and culture, whether it's you're an urban person, you're a rural person, you're on campus, you're off campus, you're from the Eastern US, the Western US, et cetera. So stories allow us all to be part of the discussion versus saying that we're going to look at something sort of dry like a case study. Noah means without concealment, blame, and for building empathy. So when we look at an SDG and use an example again of what we did last year with No Hunger, building empathy was to look at No Hunger on our own campuses. We brought it back to per personal stories on our own campuses. What is the hunger on Colorado State's campus? Not what is the hunger in a country that none of us have been to, or to some far off community, but right in our own homes. And that's that part of that building empathy. And it gets into thinking about how we as individuals or as individual countries or individual communities address the sustainable development goals. They're very much a localized and individual um, goal setting operation. And the second thing about the, th the third part, the NOAA part, is this idea of inclusion of the, into the conversation of things beyond just the delegates who are at the, at the main COP conference. And as many of you, if you've taken a, a model UN class or if you took one of my classes, we talk a lot about the role of civil society in the UN process. And that's built into the UN's foundation, how it exists. Civil society works to recognize groups um, that can attend most, usually all, but most except for the Security Council um, bodies and entities of the UN and share voice as a body and an entity within the UN. 
So in a subnational inclusion includes civil society, youth, indigenous people, businesses, all of these groups that are not necessarily uh, represented in the national government. So again, thinking about our own projects a little bit, you could say that if you're looking at no hunger, a Colorado state, or in, in the case of last year, we combined it with Scripps Institute, you may also look at hunger within the community, hunger within a subset of that community, as well as hunger on campus as part of that sort of goal of the dialogue. Next slide. So how did we get there? And I think just a slight background and then I'll turn the floor over to Sarah H to go into some more details, is that we, the Paris Agreement, when it came through in 20, sorry, 2015, it's important just to put everything in context for a second. So the Rio conventions that we discussed earlier started in 1992 and Rio plus 20 came in 2012. And the Rio Plus 20, as you may recall, was the foundation for the Sustainable Development Goals, as we discussed last week. But the Paris Agreement is a separate entity within a separate body of the UN structure. So it's important just to keep that in mind as we move through, because these are two forces moving in parallel, but not from the same origin. So the Paris Agreement sits under the UNFCCC, uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is itself sits under what's called one of the organs of the UN, which is fondly known as ECSOC, or the Economic and Social Organ of the UN, which is one of the largest. ECSOC answers to the Secretariat of the UN. And we'll talk a little bit more on why that becomes important. But again, backing up, the Paris Agreement came after Kyoto Protocols were expiring. And the Kyoto Protocols had two elements, Annex 1 countries, or what we now call developed countries, and Annex 2, or developing countries. And there were some variations on that terminology, but essentially there were two categories, and there was not a lot of movement between those two categories that was recognized in that agreement. So as the Kyoto Agreement was coming to a close, the question is what was going to re replace the Paris Agreement? And there was a process to start it in Copenhagen, COP15, which took about five years to figure out what would be the next step coming from Kyoto to a new agreement, which became the Paris Agreement. But also in that context, remembering the Paris Agreement itself was agreed to less than three weeks from after one of the most horrific terrorist attacks on French soil, and that was the Paris terror terrorist attacks that took place in early November. And the Paris Agreement was signed in late November. And it's important that it took place in Paris, not the terrorist attacks, the agreement took place in Paris because there was a lot of world unity on trying to find a solution for some of the things and have that solution take place in Paris and for the country of France that had just gone through so much tragedy. So the important part of that also is right at the same time the Sustainable Development Goals are moving through the General Assembly, which is a separate organ of the UN. They weren't signed until after the Paris Agreement 2016, but as you recall, they were first described in Rio plus 20. So they were working their way through. So for the Paris Agreement to go into force, and we're going to go through the Paris Agreement later in the semester, there's a key component that we want you to keep in mind as we move through it and what makes this particular agreement so different than previous environmental agreements. For the Paris Agreement, each country, every individual country, had to determine its own capacity. So it's a self-determining, it's not being set by categories. Each country had to look internally and decide what can it do to address the climate change and mostly through emissions, greenhouse gases. So it became this term as common but differentiated responsibilities to address climate change. So next slide. So where we, this comes into is again to put it in context. So Lima, and you'll hear a lot of terms, the Lima Action Plan started the process to Paris. 
Paris has a key word, again, when we go through the Paris Agreement, which said that we want to be able to keep global warming well below two degrees. And what that triggered in that common but differentiated responsibility is how would we achieve that? So that triggered a new report by the IPCC called a special report or the 1.5 degree special report. That report did not come out for about two years until Bonn, Germany. So when Germany comes up, you have this 1.5 degree report, which says that we are not going to achieve less than four degrees warming, unless we do something what was known as ambitious um, and bold. So the Bonn agreement came up with this sort of the the slag line about being ambitious. And the ambitious coalition was quite famously led by Marshall Islands, who put a 16 year old youth in charge of their delegation. Um, and I think we have, I, th I think in our notes for later, or if not, we can put it in the notes, um, a video of her recorded speech um, from the Marshall Islands. So once the 1.5 came out, and it was clear that it was gonna be a struggle to meet the 1.5, Part of what Bond said was, well, we need to make sure all the players are engaged in us meeting 1.5. And that included, very importantly, it included multinationals. And multinational corporations are probably the biggest change that was, the attempt was to bring their conversation into the language, so the multinational corporations. So at that table in Bonn, IKEA was there, Walmart was there, Coca-Cola company was there, some of these big multinationals. And the question was, these players need to be at the table as we discuss how individual countries have to get to this individually determined contribution to reducing greenhouse gases. Now, despite whatever your opinion is of Walmart and everybody else, the thing to think about is not necessarily the end product of retail, but to think about the process, otherwise known as shipping and transportation. So if you ship goods from one country to another, whose responsibility is that shipping? Is it the destination country or is it the originating company? So 1.5 report is released. Um, it's pretty clear that the goals of the Paris Agreement are not gonna attain that goal. So the discussion is how do we get there? So just follow up on last thing in last year in Madrid, um, which some of us in this room were at the Madrid conference, the new IPCC reports for land and oceans and the cryosphere were all released. Um, and a lot of them showed how much that gap uh, was still to be for us to be able to attain anything close to reducing global emissions and climate, the impacts of climate change uh, to keep it below 1.5 degrees. So let's take a look and see what that looks like. Next slide. So common but differentiated responsibilities is a huge step from the Kyoto Protocol to the Paris of this idea that every country can decide for itself um, and it can say what it intends to do, otherwise known as an INDC, or what does it think it can do internally on its own capacity to address climate change which gets into a lot of how it determines its own emissions and, it, and uh, address its own emissions in terms of the global stock of climate change emissions. Next slide. So the difference on that was that everybody then has a role to play and every single country has to sign the Paris Agreement, including the US, has to include a nationally determined contributions document before they're considered signature of the Paris Agreement. So this is what some of these things sort of look like. This is an idea of this current gap. So the Paris Agreement is set to expire in 2030. Um, and you see that the current gap is business as usual, which is usually in the blue. The current target, um, which is the two degrees free. And then where this gap is like to get to 1.5, this is what we need to do to get there. I mean, as you can see, in many cases, the projection is huge that we're going to miss between 1.5 and two degrees, we're missing by quite a bit. So the Paris Agreement set up three things, accountability, 
transparency are two big sort of words that you'll hear a lot as we move through the international process. And the third thing called the global stock take, which if you think about it, it's coming up in two years. And the global stock take before the pandemic hit was to see how well we were accomplishing addressing this gap between what we need to do to get the global warming below two degrees or well below two degrees at the 1.5 level. Next slide. So as you can see, the gap is huge. And that's sort of a little bit scary on how that works. So how does this get back to the dialogues and sort of thinking a little bit about these nationally determined contributions or the intended, the, that's the I again, um, national determined contributions. And this map is something you can look at a little bit later. And we've got a couple of these. These come out and I tried to put the sources for most of these maps um, either on the slide or at the end of the slide, so you can actually go and look a lot of these at these data. But you see that these nationally determined contributions have two main elements that are usually addressed. And one is this, you know, what is the priority for that country and what are some of the targets? And if you look at that, there are a whole bunch of little icons. And what's neat about these icons, if you look down below, most of them will tie to a sustainable development goal. So what the icon is saying is this is how this country through using what it saw as its main um, elements to address the gap between where we need to go as business as usual to where we wanna be, which is the 1.5. So where are we going and how do we think we're gonna get there? What is our target to get to that 1.5 and what do we need to get there? So if you go to the next slide, so that's the priority and target. So I think it's the same as the sustainable development goals we talked about, and then what is the target to get there? And the third part is to simply measure the progress. So the country itself is supposed to do an internal, again, the term is stock take, how close are we getting um, before the global stock take, which is scheduled for 2023 um, based on the Paris Agreement. So 2023 is the big year for looking what is our progress and how well are we doing? So next slide. So you can see the INDCs and the NDCs are the tool to decide what is common but differentiated responsibility mean and every country has a role to do it. So the question becomes, and that's that other term that was in the Paris Agreement called transparency is how did you get there? How did you figure out those numbers? Where did those numbers come from? Internal to a country. And again, in the back of your mind, don't forget that multinational corporation floating around. So in Bonn, Germany, the question was raised, okay, we're not gonna make this gap, but we need to be able to ask these questions and we need to ask it for all stakeholders, um, including the multinationals, including our local and indigenous communities, which in the UN world are combined as one, it's local and indigenous communities. Um, and that's an important sort of point we can, we'll discuss later. But how, where are we now within the country from the perspectives of all of those people? You know, as, as saw that first slide, the big subnationals. How do we wanna go? What is our process? Do we wanna get there? And how do we get there? What do we need to do? So I think my next slide, I then turn it over to Sarah H, but let me just double check. So we'll just go on to the next slide. Yes, Sarah H, we are now turning the floor over to you to discuss about those three main elements. Where are we now? Where do we wanna go? And how are we gonna get there? Sure. And um, hi, everyone. Maybe first I should say that I'm a sociocultural anthropologist. And so my discipline is really based on hearing people's experiences in the contexts that they're working, both cultural, but also social, governmental, individual. And, um, I turned to the Talanoa Dialogues when I was working with a community here in Colorado that had built a resiliency initiative based on the exact same questions. We did a three-day retreat uh, based on the questions, where are we now, where do we want to go, and how the heck are we going to get there? And that really resonated with the stories that it heard about what happened in Bonn, um, just to, to enrich the, the wonderful uh, historical view that Gillian's already offered us. Remember, in Bonn, 
we just learned that the United States intends to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. Um, doesn't necessarily look like we're on track to meeting the Paris um, goals. And when uh, the Fijian president of the General Assembly introduced these, uh, this Talanoa dialogue process, which is a version uh, that our legendary in anthropology throughout Polynesian cultures of problem solving for the greater good, where you listen to everyone and you acknowledge all of the differences and the conflicts and the differential stakes and the differential responsibilities. And by all accounts, hearing these voices of youth, these indigenous and local voices, voices of women, um, led to a tr tremendous shift. Um, that one of the best stories is that it was a 19 year old woman who kept standing up on the negotiating floor and saying coming out of these stories, but we need to stick with 1.5 degrees uh, of a limit of warming, not two. So it was a 19 year old woman who's often credited with having made that ambitious goal. Anyway, um, as soon as my class went online, I turned back to the Talanoa dialogues with the idea that this is something that can really work with so much flexibility and virtually, and we can hear from people all over the place. And in talks with Gillian and the other Sarahs, um, it seems like there's real potential for that to be a good adaptation to what the work we're doing across these campuses in our YAY um, Alliance. And so I wanna say a couple things. One is that this can be tailored to whatever you as a student, you as a fellow, you as a faculty member, whatever the class is really focused on. Um, this is in some ways the applied aspects of, your, of the discipline that the class is on. Um, the, the ways that these storytelling circles um, can evolve can really be something that you shape in your conversations in, in, inside your teams and relevant to the goals of the class. Um, for example, in my case, my anthropology students will be recruiting a community member who resonates with a particular SDG. It might not be so directly tied to, to uh, um, climate action, but all of these things do tie together. That's why the SDGs are a holistic approach to sustainable development. Um, my students will be recruiting someone else that they'll bring and they'll both be participating in telling a story. Now, does that sound intimidating? These don't necessarily have to be once upon a time um, with a, a crisis in the middle kinds of structured stories often and, and um, the resources that we'll put up give lots of examples. Often these can come out of very personal just experiences or how I learned to adapt this practice, how I, how I uh, uh, came upon this different framework for even thinking about things. And they might re relate to birds or, or reusable plastics, et cetera, et cetera. They, they can really be tailored to that group and to the goals. It might just be a group of students doing it. It might be students listening in and being the rapporteur out when community members are, 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 are sharing in these Talanoa dialogues. So all of those things can really be adapted to the particular cases. Um, you'll see in the guide with lots of examples, all of the different kinds of organizations and different foci we have from various Buddhist and other religious organizations. We have the Global Council of Mayors. We have um, corporate leaders internationally. And, and so this is part, we're really joining a kind of diverse ground, grassroots and ground level discussion about these kinds of, of um, ways of tying the sustainable development goals to the larger global effort and conversation. I think that's all I need to say for now. Is there anything else? Okay, next slide, I think. Okay, so before we go into the next, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah W um, for the instructions here. Um, do you have any questions on the current process? And again, think about the, as Sarah H just said, the stories, maybe the stories within your community, it may be the stories within your campus that address the sustainable development goal that you've chosen to work on. Um, and those stories could be about, you know, wildlife, the wildland urban interface for sustainable development goal number 15. It could be about plastics in the ocean for state. You know, so it, the, the term story doesn't just mean to be human centric. It can be broadly centric, but it just means bringing in all sorts of different viewpoints 
into how we look at our issues. And it gives us three metrics that we can define as we move through this course. You know, first we'll be deciding on that goal, where are we now? Uh, what's the current status of plastics um, outside of Boston Harbor, for example, for Boston University, or any of the other people who are interested in looking at that particular goal? You know, and then how, how do we want to get there? What are we looking at to address the plastics in the ocean? So that's how those stories and those three questions become important metrics that you can use to build your final product. So with that, because we'd be mindful of time, Sarah, am I turning this now over to you? Sarah W. Um, for that conversation. And as a reminder to everyone, fellow students, professors, um, these slides are available. So, you know, we're going through them pretty quickly and um, they're available on Slack. I'll make sure that this slide deck is up on Slack. Um, and for those that are on Slack right now, Omna has graciously been uploading the Zoom recording. So if you ever want to go back and watch this recording with the lecture notes included, um, that's also available on Slack. So if you have questions about how to access any of these resources, just let me know, send me a Slack message and we can go from there. But we want to give all that haven't been assigned to a team, um, so the remaining students of the class, um, some time to you know, pick the SDG team that you would like to be a part of. Um, so I'm gonna open breakout rooms in a couple minutes, just waiting on folks to chat. If there's, um, if there's like a SDG group that you would like to start with. Um, alternatively, you know, I can keep all students in the main room and then you can just, you know, yell out which room you would like me to add you to and I can do that as well. Um, but fellows and professors that are on right now, um, I have you assigned for your breakout room. And so, you know, welcome students as they come in and out, um, you know, answer any questions that you have. Um, fellows, if you haven't met your um, professor that is your mentor, you know, have a conversation with them, things like that. Um, but really just a chance for everyone to, you know, have those first introductions, first touch points. And like Gillian said, we'll be talking a little bit more about team dynamics and how to work as a virtual team next week during lecture. Um, so this first meet and greet is is really to just help you pick a team that you would like to focus with, um, which SDG you would like to do going on to the rest of the semester. So are there any questions? And I see Emily wants to join Climate Action. Um, just a reminder, if you are in a breakout room and your faculty is gone, your um, fellow is gone, although I believe all fellows, the SDG 9 are here, um, if you say anything that you want to like save for later, um, unfortunately breakout rooms are not recorded. So just make note of that either on Slack or on your own end and um, just, just so you don't lose that thought. Um, but that's an unfortunate thing about Zoom. So Sarah, are you going to let people go in and out of their own rooms or are you orchestrating it? Yeah, great question. I'm going to be here in the main room and I will facilitate any moves that folks would like. Um, so if you are not in a room to start off or you're in a room and you change your mind, just come back to the main Zoom room. You can leave the breakout room and I can reassign you as you see fit. So do you, uh, are you sure that people can leave breakout rooms? Because sometimes they can't. Um, I think you have yes, to be- allow participants to return to the main session at any time. Okay, so okay good, to good, okay. Thanks so one sort of reminder, um, when you go to the breakout rooms, if you either can pull up the slide deck or we'll put the slide deck somewhere, there are actually a couple of tasks that we would like you to do in that uh, breakout room. Um, and one, Sarah, the slide deck is up on, on Slack. I will stop share my screen right now just so I can share it as we speak. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll post the slide deck on Slack. There are a couple of tasks you need to do. Number one is make sure you've introduced yourselves to everybody so you can share um, contact information, how you're going to get in contact. You may or may, as Sarah G said, you may only have one or two people in the room, but we still have a couple of things that we'd like you to do. And again, always remember we have other universities that are going to add in, we have other students adding in. So this is just us getting started. So don't panic if you're in the room by yourself. I see a couple of faculty members are missing. Um, if anyone is interested in SDG 9, 
we are currently missing both the faculty member and the Yay fellow. So either just shoot us a, a message or just stay in the main plenary and we can get you set up. But the first goal is just meet each other, meet and greet. Um, everyone's from different universities, they're from different areas in the country. Um, gives you a chance to meet the faculty advisor in different rooms and as I said, zip in and out. We're gonna spend some time on this so everyone can feel by the end and we can send some mornings and, and chats to get everybody up to speed. Also, one last reminder is the chat box um, is the one chat box for all um, rooms. So if you put something in the chat box, everybody sees it. So it doesn't tie to the individual rooms. All right, so I'm going to open breakout rooms and students that haven't been assigned um, to a breakout room yet, you know, stay in the main room and um, tell me which room you'd like to join. Um, these rooms are going off of those SDG groups that um, Gillian mentioned at the beginning of class. Um, and the lecture notes are, or lecture slides are now on Slack under the channel lectures. Um, so if you need to reference that again, um, let me know. Or if you're having issues accessing it, let me know. I think we have everyone back. And so Gillian, I don't know if you want me to resume, share on slides, or just talk a little bit based on folks' preference I received as to some observations um, of team, team dynamics and the like. Well, it sounds like we have a little bit of an uneven spread at the moment. Um, you said you've got too many in one group? Yeah, SDG 13 seems to be off the charts. I don't know, Sarah G, you must be really popular. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants to be with Sarah, Sarah G. So <laughs> I guess what I would start is that we need a more even distribution among the SDGs. So maybe Sarah, if you put that chart back up and some of the folks in SDG 13 could look at some of their second choices and put those in the chat box so we can reassign folks so my goal would be in the next sort of 10, 15 minutes is that we need even sized teams. I should have added that as a goal. <laughs> so, so we can chuck folks out or we can <laughs> volunteer to move to what makes us interested. Can so, you sorry. all see my screen? Yeah. Okay. And you can post if you don't feel comfortable talking via Zoom or um, commenting in the chat box. You can also reply to the thread in Slack. That's that's okay too. Um, and you know, as Gillian's mentioned a couple times, um, at this point, you know, more students will be joining. So it's not terrible if the groups are small to begin, as more will um, join in and and contribute as their classes begin. Um, so just keep that in mind as well. Um, but yeah, I was. By by far, um, SDG 13 has most, most people in their interest. Um, so just evening that out, I think, would be um, beneficial. So what we could do is start at the top. Um, seems like we've got some volunteers. And I know we don't have all of the folks on the call um, and just work our way through to see if we can get some evening out and I can talk for STG nine since Ali's not on the call, but that helps sort of even things out and mm -hmm. go ahead. And also this reminder, especially to the students, um, the SDG title is just the overarching goal. There are 169 targets within the title. So climate action sounds really cool, but it's the targets that you really wanna pay attention to. So again, the example, if you look at life underwater, one target is marine protected areas and another target is marine plastic. So it's, they're very different topics. So it's important to look at the target, not just the title of the SDG, even though we have you organized by SDGs. So with that being said, let's look at SDG three. Emily, are you on the call? And I don't, yeah. I don't okay. Did you have anybody uh, in your room? Uh, no, it was just me. That's just because Diane um, isn't here. Okay, so what's your interest in good health and well-being? Um, I was hoping, 
I could focus on mental health and like maybe the stigma behind mental health in like the global south also maybe even in America. Okay so and is that one of the targets within that goal? Um I have not checked. Okay so that may be something to think about. Um, so hopefully, as everyone listening, if anyone's interested in health, please do join SDG3. So SDG4, I see Pam's on the call. And Melissa was with Pam on that one. That's the fellow. So either Pam or Melissa, if you want to talk real quick. Melissa, go ahead if you'd like to. OK, so we are doing quality education. We didn't really look at the target, but we did discuss um, the article that Sarah posted on Slack. We just discussed how we would like to, I'm not sure if that's a we thing, but I mentioned how it'd be interesting to tie the other SDGs into quality education, like no poverty and seeing how that affects students in their ability to learn and seeing what our campuses are doing or our communities in general looking at different countries. So just like generally talking what we could do, but um, definitely looking to expand and see what everyone can contribute to SDG4. So thank you for that. How many other people did you have in the room with you? Uh, it was just looks like a zero. <laughs> okay, so for next week, what you might do, and this would be for everyone, is to take a look at those targets and think of which one sort of um, sort of grab your interests and then you can sort of proselytize to get other people to join your team. Um, one thing you may look at is the United Nations environment has an entire education branch within it um, that's based out of Nairobi, Kenya, and they're doing some really interesting stuff on how to use the SDGs in classrooms. So another one to think about. All right, SDG 9, I know has no one on there. Um, Ali is one of our students and Leah said she could not join today. Um, that's what, one that takes a good look at things like infrastructure and innovation. So it's also some of the technology things. Um, and like we talked before about Millennium Development Goal number eight, that actually now falls under SDG nine. So if there's any of the technology and those types of advances that you're interested in um, and policies regarding those and policies such as um, sharing technologies, um, privacy rights for technologies, et cetera, it, STG 9 may be something that you're interested in. Uh, Sarah H for STG 11, Sustainable Cities. Yeah, and Elise was with me, so maybe I can hand okay. that over to her to get us going. Perfect. Yes, um, so for STG 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities, so we wanted to focus more on the community level. Um, more importantly, our in universities and our institutions that we're at since we were all kind of spread all over and we have a couple of engineers in our group so we're trying to figure out how to kind of scale things um, at the university level and to connect the community to the environment so. that's and a great example um, and again take a look at the targets in there, um, I believe there's, if I'm remembering, I don't have the targets up in front of me, I believe there's a partnership target in the under sustainable cities. But the other thing to think about is that the UNFCCC has what's called the local and indigenous communities, um, which says there's also a whole civil society group on local governance. Um, and the, part of that is the role that subnationals have um, within creating an environmental framework a sustainable framework and sustainable cities or cities, city governments, municipal governments fall under that rubric. So it's just a really interesting tie to a specific chapter under UNFCCC. How many students did you have in your group? We have two both from MTU, Michigan Tech. Both from Michigan Tech? Yes. Okay, yeah. so you can happily ask the two of them to do rock, scissor, etc. and somebody needs to switch. Remember the rule was can't be your home institution faculty lead, can't be the fellow from the same institution, and can't be a student from the same institution. So we need one Michigan Tech on that one, and somebody needs to switch to another one. So we'll let you guys talk about that offline. So here's our big one. Um, next one is um, SDG 12, before we get to our big one. Um, Anna, would you like to talk about that one? 
Yes, sure. So I'm with Dr. Gillian on that, and we didn't have anybody in our room, which is okay. We're not sad. But um, so if anybody wants to look at the targets, there are nine of them, and they're very interesting, although it seems like it's a little bit irrelevant. But if you look at the targets, there's responsible management of chemical waste, and then uh, global per capita food waste and whatnot, which is all things that are very uh, relatable to everybody. And Dr. Gillian and I were, Dr. Bowser and I were discussing um, like we could do surveys on uh, how uh, universities or students, grad students would manage their chemical waste and then how even in public uh, people use paint and lead based paint and all that stuff. How that could be, we could do something, a project on that too. So yeah, we were just discussing things among ourselves because it was just the two of us, but yeah. So I think that one needs a couple of folks to think about, and we talked a lot about chemicals, so it'd be great if we have some folks interested in going to um, SDG 12. And yeah, we're getting some background noise, which is probably either Sarah or I, because we have a class that's busy slacking away, um, and I don't see how to turn it off. But hmm. <laughs> so anyway, we we'll apologize for that clicking noise. That's from the two of us. All right, next one is SDG 13. So as we say in musical chairs, everybody get ready to switch. Um, Sarji and yeah. Macy. So who's in charge? Who's going to speak first? Uh, Macy, do you want to do you want to jump in here? Sure. Um, we talked mainly just about ourselves and our our interests and our um, research interests. Um, so we didn't get into the nitty gritty quite yet. But uh, yeah, we have a, a pretty good sized group. But it looks like there's more people who are switching around. So. Okay, so you have um, uh, how many have, how many students did you have? Uh, six maybe. Six, yeah, six plus me, and there were four from Fort Collins. Oh, CSU students. Oh, four, I see. Yeah. But some were there were they were both masters and undergraduates, so they were kind of scattered. Mm -hmm. No. Do we, do we even have enough students to have? I mean enough groups for all the students to be not with other students from their campus? Yes, for, you, for your students and my students, yes. We do, okay. Because we only have five, so if you have three, there are too many. <laughs> I, 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 I added another one, now I have four. <laughs> so. Yeah, so C, CSU students, I see Shenway, looks like she switched. Um, CSU students, we need to switch around. We only need one on 13. Okay, it looks like Emily is willing to go to 14 or 15. So we'll get that sorted out shortly. 14, 15, neither Andrew or Javier are on. Emma, let me see if Emma is on. Yeah, Emma yeah, is on hi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and Zach. Yeah, Zach had to go early to a class. So um, I was covering, so it was me and Abby on the call and we kind of talked about our general interests kind of spanning from chemistry to biology and What's cool about this group is that it's combining two different SDGs, so looking at life both um, on land and below water. So I think there's there's power to have a lot of connections between those and a, a lot of the um, different targets are, there are a lot of similar, similarities such as, you know, overfishing or poaching or um, thing like loss of biodiversity in both. Um, so I think, um, there, there's there are ways to kind of have our focus be a connection between the two, um, and also welcome Emily if if that's working out that you're joining. Um, that's awesome. Okay, well we'll probably do eventually because um, probably when Andrew's class joins, is it will get too big. Is we'll probably split those back mm -hmm. out. Um, it's just that Javier has a conflict with most of these times, so that's why we originally left it together. But as you guys sort of develop your plans, you know, you can think about okay, we've got enough to really split these apart. Um, versus keeping them together. So you and Zach can talk about that offline and choose a target within those goals to take a look at. So okay. it doesn't necessarily have to be together. And last but not least, I know we don't have Jesse on the call, so we have Kazmali. So we can talk about SDG 16. Hello, everyone. Uh, I was peacefully by myself thinking to myself about the different ways that uh, SDG 16 could move forward. Uh, and one thing I wanted to note is that uh, in the, the creation of this group, we're also working or thinking about combining with SDG 17, uh, global partnerships. Uh, and one of the things that I'm personally interested in thinking about uh, modeling 
in different areas, the different approaches and seeing what sort of uh, uh, approaches work in different areas for in different places for different things, which could be localized to different campuses and different approaches to these uh, sort of su sustainable development goals on different uh, campuses, as well as thinking about uh, an interest in the sort of north-south trade as well as south-south trade and uh, how sort of institutions of higher learning place themselves within that in terms of intellectual space. Uh, and then for goal 16, uh, I, was, I was thinking in the midst of sort of Black Lives Matter in the United States, it'd be interesting thinking about uh, some of these goals like uh, journalists and media, violence, uh, police brutality uh, in relationship to uh, these other sustainable development goals. So those are some ideas I had, but uh, definitely flexible and interested in working with uh, anyone, other, anyone else's ideas. Guys, by now you all realize that I'm I'm from Brooklyn, New York, so I'm horrible at pronouncing anything other than coffee. Uh, so, uh, coffees and cars is where I come from in Brooklyn. So, v Vina said she'd be fine with SDG 16. So maybe you can do a, a quick wave to Kasmali and introduce yourselves to each other so you can get that conversation started. Um, and then maybe I'll have Sarah and it looks like Emily as well. Oh, oh we got two different Emilys. Um, Emily Milhoff um, also said 16, so she maybe could also talk with Cosmali. So Sarah W, if you want to sort of read down the list and make sure you've got everybody in the right group and we've got everybody sort of spread out. Um, and I'm gonna see if I can figure out what the notification problem is on my side. <laughs> so I'm gonna mute. Yeah, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put that um, table that was in the lecture slides on Slack um, after this class is done, just so you know, folks, all, all these pitches were made and, and things like that. Um, and yes, as Cosmoly is saying, um, 16, 17 is a paired group. Um, so thanks for that clarification. But what I'm going to do is um, put that table up on Slack and have students sign up. So because there were just a lot of Zoom messages and things like that coming through. Um, and so, you know, based on the group that you were in or the group that you offered to join, um, just write your name down into that table so we're all aware as to where you're going and so we can double check that that institutional spread is um, present. Um, so that will be up on Slack um, by this afternoon after this class gets done. Um, I think that'll just be the easiest way to go about it. Okay, so before we close out, we're at 2.15. If you go back to the slide deck real quick, Sarah, what we did is we put in a series of slides, some references and some steps as to what we'd like to get done by next week. Um, so we're not gonna go through them now. So if everyone can make sure you take a look at that slide deck. So you know, what are our objectives for next week? And you see one of them is to try and meet up with who's currently on your team, get some time set up as to when you can get you know, meet and get together, um, exchange information on Slack. We'll have Slack channels set up for everybody. It's important to get these, these steps started as we work our way towards these teams. Again, we have two classes coming in at very short notice. Um, so the three questions that just start to ask is number one is get that, uh, we have reissue what we call a code of conduct. Um, I, again, be real mindful of our time please take a look at that and make sure it's posted. Um, take a hard look at the targets within your STG. There are a lot of them. And think about those three questions and see which one do you think you can get all the way through? Where are we now? How do we wanna, where do we wanna go? And how do we wanna get there? Um, and then think about that draft outline in Slack. Again, that will be your little advertisement to try and get folks to join your group. Um, and again, be mindful that no one else from your institution is on that group, um, unless you're from the University of Derby, which is, has a big class. So everybody else should be only one per, per team. So that's all I have for today. Sarah H or Pam, anything else for the good of the order? Sounds good to me, thanks. All right, so we look forward to seeing everybody on Slack. Um, and yay fellows and yay principals, we'll see you guys on Monday. And have a great day, everybody. And, and stay dry if you're not getting snowed on like we are. <laughs> we have a lot of snow at the moment. <laughs>
and I'll see my class in class or if you want to be on Zoom in class on Monday. So. Sounds good. Well, have a great week, you all, and talk to you all soon.